Listener Production. commentator and journalist Greg Rust and this is Rusty's Garage. In this episode I'm at Mount Panorama for the biggest weekend of racing on the Australian calendar, the Bathurst 1000. To celebrate the Falcons final race here Ford has decided to stage a speed comparison with various cars including the awesome Le Mans winning GT. Expat Aussie Ryan Briscoe knows the car well and has flown out from America to drive it. We found a quieter spot in the 23 Red Racing Team Transporter in the paddock to talk about his diversely successful career and how it all began. You know, Uncle Doug, for sure. Uh, my dad uh, was rallying as well uh, at the same time. Doug kept it going a long time after Dad stopped, I think. Dad uh, committed more of his time to, to work and to me and, and my go-karts and stuff. But, um, yeah, no, definitely uh, racing in the blood. Um, yeah, my, you know, Dad and Uncle Doug, you know, loved the, the rallying and, um, you know, it was funny just catching up with them, you know, this week and talking about the old rally times and cars that they had and how they raced them and how they drove. And um, it's very different to what I do, but at the same time it's you know, all the same sport. It is the antithesis of, of what you've gone into from a career point of view. Were you ever tempted by rallying? Have you ever had a steer of something like that? Um, no, well, I uh, I drove Neil Bates's uh, Toyota uh, back when I was, you know, test driver at Toyota F1. So um, we did a thing out at Oran Park. There was a dirt track out there and it was a four-wheel drive. Uh, I think it was a Corolla or something. But... Um, it was, it was really cool. So different to what I was driving, the Formula One car at the time. Um, and to make it turn, you actually had to get on the throttle, you know, being a four-wheel drive, which was completely different to what I was used to. But other than that, actually, uh, my first taste was probably um, back when I was racing go-karts and I was teammates with uh, Rosberg. And I'd go on holidays with them every now and again. And uh, one time, Keki took us up to Finland Um, in the winter and uh, we went to this sort of I guess it was kind of like a driving school Um, I forget what the car was it was a rear wheel drive and and we went through a series of courses so Nico and myself and Keke did some driving too but uh, we started on like this big oval and the goal was to drive the thing sideways the whole way around the oval and (laughs) just learn how to drift on ice and uh, and then there was a slalom course and then we uh, ended up on this about a one kilometre circuit and just thrashed doing laps around that with the walls were just snow banks and uh, so that was just a really really good experience I'll never forget just you know really learning about car control and I was just racing go-karts at the time so uh, it was pretty memorable Have you retained contact with him? I mean he obviously went on to win the Formula 1 World Championship and then shocked everyone by yeah. pulling up stumps, were, were you surprised by that and have you maintained contact with him? Yeah, yeah, we're in touch um, it was surprising um, but at the same time I, I, I understood where he was coming from but I mean it, it was surprising no doubt especially when you are retiring from a, a winning program where he could have very well come back and won the championship the next year and the year after that you know so um, but yeah I think you know he's he just loves what he's doing you know and it's he, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets back in into racing again but uh, you know he's been keeping so busy doing everything outside of actually driving but within motorsport um, I I'm not sure if you regret I've never really talked to him about that specifically but uh it was definitely an interesting uh, interesting call, wasn't it? Absolutely. We'll get to your karting career in a moment because it was stellar, some great achievements there. What were the cars in the driveway uh, when you were growing up? You talked about your dad and your uncle before. What were the, the family cars when you were growing up? Family cars? Well, um, Dad always enjoyed having something down in the garage, you know, restoring. I remember he had uh, an MG that he was restoring for most of my child life and MGB what MGA MGA I think it was I don't think it was an MGB but um, yeah I just remember beautiful thing and um, you know at the very beginning he had his Ford Escort uh, down there that which is what he used to race 
um, and then you had the MG, and then, uh, but then you know, you know, Dad's in the car business, so there were always Something. different cars coming back. And uh, when I was about uh, ten or eleven, he brought home a Datsun twelve hundred U. And that's what I learned to drive on. So that was my car to basically <laughs> drive and reverse and drive up and down the driveway and stuff like that. We lived in a cul-de-sac, so that was sort of what I learned to use a clutch on and, and all that, you know. So, yeah. Awesome. How did the foray into racing start and, and where was the first race? Tell me about the first go-kart and so on. Um, yeah, well, Lithgo actually uh, is where I started. Not uh, all that far from where we're doing this interview, really, is it? No, and I, I actually called in on the way up here yesterday so I was yeah driving up and I saw the sign for you know combined districts cart club and I was like oh I've got to go in there so I just pulled in I was hoping some you know some carters might have been there testing it was raining uh, but no one was there but I just sort of walked around a bit and took a photo and you know I haven't been to Lithgow racetrack since you know shit probably the mid 90s to early 90s so I mean because I raced there when I started and then you know, 95, 97, yeah, then I left here and, and went to race full-time in Europe. But, um, yeah, Lithgow, that's pretty much where it started. The first time I ever drove a go-kart, uh, which was just, I don't know, Dad just, I don't know if it was our go-kart or just a friend's, but I went to Raleigh, um, or Rally, sorry, Rally Kart Club up near Coffs Harbour. Yes. Which still probably rates as maybe one of the best go-kart tracks in the world yeah um but yeah i drove that when i was maybe nine so i just remember i drove a cart then i've i don't really remember it but i've got pictures i'm there with my you know motorcycle helmet on and you know the motorbike leather gloves and you know my sneakers which are worn out with holes in them from skateboarding and stuff and (laughs) there i am driving a go-kart and then I i didn't start racing till i was 11 and my first race was at lithgow Fantastic. Did it come easily to you? Did you immediately think, man, this is a bit of me? I mean, w- w- what effect did it have on you? Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it did come easy, for sure. I never felt like I had to, you know, go outside my comfort zone to to do anything special to race a go-kart. And uh, I just started and, you know, Dad, as a mechanic... It was just so meticulous. So we always showed up with the best looking, you know, the cleanest, the cleanest go-kart. And and I think that always made a big difference because, you know, our stuff was always straight. Nothing was bent, you know. It was like, uh, you know, really good preparation and a lot of thanks to Dad for, for the hours he put in down in the garage preparing carts every weekend. I have more respect for what he did back then now than what I did at the time. Um but yeah, I mean, we we started the first couple of races were okay. I was on a a DAP chassis that was way too big for how small I was. I was a tiny eleven year old. I'm not that big of a thirty seven year old right now, but I was a tiny eleven year old. And uh, so soon after that, you know, after a few races, we saw that all the all the fast guys were winning on a dy- Dino chassis or Dino chassis. Um, and uh, so we got a Dino chassis, and then as soon as we got that, I started just winning races and uh yeah it all sort of happened pretty quickly i I mean it was all it's a bit of a blur now because yeah we just kept winning i was running different classes and and uh before i knew it dad was like let's go to let's go to the world championships in portugal because courtney was going he he picked up sponsorship from tony cart and so they'd invited him to go over to the junior world championships um in portugal in 95 and so sort of pretty much last hour I think dad was like you know we we could go and do that so we just packed up we rented a couple of carts from CRG and uh, took all our own engines over took our engine builder who was Brian Lindsay and um, he had experience with racing in Europe from years before so we just went over there spent the month um, got set up at the factory in Italy and they gave us you know a van to go to the track local track to just test the carts at and then uh, I, went, I went. We did this one race um, in Portugal in the cadet class. So there was like they sort of split juniors into two because there were like over a hundred entrants in both classes, and only thirty-two would make the final. So we went there, and we we're just like, oh, if we can make the final, this will be this will be an accomplishment, you know, just to show up and be a presence. And 
Well, in the end, I, I qualified second after all the heats. We did five heats. I was on pole for the pre-final. And then uh, you would run one set of tyres for the whole weekend. And uh, we, I ended up graining the front tyres a bit and uh, ended the final, I think, 11th. You know, the front tyres were just finished. But um, came back home uh, to finish the Australian Championship. Um, and then it was a couple of months later and we got a phone call from CRG and they uh, said, hey, you know, we'd, we'd love to sign you up as a factory driver and so from then basically all my racing was was paid for and um you know sort of led to me then uh a year later when i was old enough to race in the senior class to move to italy and race full time on the world championship circuit the the record books show you know australian titles titles in north america and italy and and things like that was that moment you just talked about pivotal in changing it from what perhaps would have been a an all-consuming hobby to uh, okay this is serious i I think i'm going to chase this as a as a career now yeah well i mean when i started racing go-karts and even when we went to do this one race in portugal i mean i was just a kid it was never even a thought of mine that I was pursuing a racing career like I, I just it never it's not like I was racing go karts. I was just having fun I was just having fun and racing and um, no honestly I mean you know where we don't have the money that it takes to you know go to you know professional racing or even that level of go-kart racing that, that I went to in Europe you know that's just something that my parents couldn't afford and um so without having that opportunity, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I would have had to learn some sort of trade in Australia that wasn't racing, I think. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, who knows? Who knows? Maybe we would have worked something out. I don't know. But uh, I think it was pivotal and um, it wasn't an easy decision because I was 15 and I went to a really good school in Sydney and... Um, you know, we knew that I was going to be sacrificing education to to go and pursue my racing, and um, you know, I'm sure there was more of a conversation between mum and dad. But the part of the conversation I remember being a part of was that this really was a once in a lifetime opportunity, and um, maybe it would work out, maybe it wouldn't. But if it didn't work out, you could, I could always come back and get your education you know and and uh you know pursue degrees or whatever you needed to do but so i left and i I continued my schooling in italy um but no one was really on my back you know pressuring me into it so that sort of lasted about a year and then so i guess the equivalent of what was you know end of year 10 um i was i was just committed fully to my racing and working at the go-kart factory Am I right in saying you can speak Italian and French fluently? And did that come out of necessity because of where you were living and, you know, working with the mechanics and, and you know, that becomes an important thing, doesn't it? Uh, it does. I mean, I, I um, it was funny. So move over there and, and um, just I'm working at the go-kart factory every day and spending time with the mechanics and they didn't really speak English, you know, a few words here and there, but you know, the mechanics are in their early 20s too. So, you know, they're young guys. And so I was hanging out with them and, and just learning language came naturally. I wasn't studying Italian. Invariably, they're funny conversations too, mate, aren't they? Because you talk some, some whether well, it's girls or whatever, you talk funny stuff, don't you? Well, and obviously they were telling me to say stuff that wasn't what I thought I was saying. Um, and I had my fun with that because then we, I had a Japanese teammate a couple of years later and I remember being a part of doing that stuff and saying... He wanted a, you know, a water or something from the barmaid, and so we'd tell him to say something that was <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> Can I have a glass of water, please? Um, but that had all happened to me as well. But it's it was actually interesting because um, in Italy there are a lot of dialects, and every town sort of has its own very strong dialect. Um, and where I was living, which was up near Brescia, they have this dialect called Bresciano. And it's it's pretty crude. And so they just had a blast teaching me dialect. So what I was learning wasn't Italian. It was their dialect. And um, so it wasn't until a couple of years later that I realised that I wasn't speaking Italian. I was speaking this dialect. And then I started studying Italian. I started going to Italian school. Um, to learn proper Italian, which was great because then I was able to learn, you know, you know, past tense, future tense, grammar, and and the rest of it, and um, you know, just really improve my Italian. Um, 
so yeah I spent I ended up spending eight years in Italy you know between racing go-karts and then when uh, I started racing cars I, I stayed in Italy um, just a different part of Italy um, but yeah then you know you, you asked about French I don't speak fluent French um, I did learn French for a while uh, when I was doing Formula 3 I was doing the Euro series and we raced in France a lot there was a lot of French media and so for a while I was studying French uh, from Italian to French I had a teacher um, you know so I, I picked up enough where I was doing interviews yep. Um, which was really good, but I never, I never kept after the French, and uh, I've pretty much lost it all. I, I wish I did. I'd keep it up, but um, but I've still got Italian, so that's good. Tell me about the transition. You touched on it there a moment ago, from carts to car racing. Am I right that it was about the turn of the century, Formula yep. Renault, and and how did that opportunity come about? And you know, how much did you grab it with both hands and, and love it? Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, it's it's such a sequence of events how things turn out you know and um i'd been racing carts in europe for a few years um i'd been with crg for three years and things were going well i mean we'd won a couple of championships but you know then in 99 i was you know they they put me on the the tire that wasn't really competing for the european and world championships and so you know i wasn't really at the front for the very big races and um Peter Collins, sorry, Peter Collins. He was sort of making a... He was hanging around the go-kart tracks and and, uh, he approached me as sort of a a manager role. I didn't have a manager or anything, you know, I was just racing for CRG and doing stuff. And so he really started showing interest in me and talking to me and um, he ended up setting up uh, a change in team for me where I went to Tony Cart for the year 2000 and um, and I, I think that's really a move that really opened up all the opportunities that led me to move on with my career to get out of go-karts so I go to Tony Cart for 2000 um, and nothing really against CRG but when I went to Tony Cart, it was just another level of professionalism. Um, just from the contract, I'd never had a contract before, and so I go to Tony Cart. They signed me up to a two-year contract um, with a salary, which I've never had before. I was just racing for free. So now I'm like, now things are getting serious. I've got a contract, I've got a salary, and um, and now you know you do a practice session. I come in and and they have me do like debrief sheets and start writing about what the setup of the cards doing Makes corner by corner. Yeah. yeah, which we never did at CRG. We should have. We sort of talked more about engines and stuff at CRG, not so much the chassis. But um, so anyway, I, I start the year two thousand at Tony Cart, and um, it's it's going well. I'm adapting to the to the new team, and it was it was early. It was maybe April or May. And uh, Toyota uh, was getting into Formula One. They were testing the Formula One car. And uh, they were starting this young driver program. And so they were starting to scout young drivers from different, uh, from go-karts, you know, and from various places. Um, so the, the team manager at Toyota was uh, Ange Pasquale. And he was heading up the Young Driver program and he'd heard of this Tony Kart driver, uh, Frank Pereira. And he'd won the, I think he'd won the Junior World Championships and Formula A World Championship. So he was like the hot shoe, young, uh, really fast French driver. And uh, so he came to Tony Kart, to Mr. Rabazzi, to ask if, um, he could arrange a meeting with Frank uh, at Monza to talk about the future and Rabazzi talked uh, Ange into meeting me as well at the same time so which was massive to me because Mr. Rabazzi was very intimidating never really showed what he thought and I always just thought he hated me although he just hired me but you know it was like you never knew like um, and just for him to really pushed Toyota to make this meeting with me was was massive so I remember I drove to Monza uh, you know t- the F1 cars were all testing out there so 
I go out there and, and have this meeting with uh, Ange Pasquale, who's Corsican. So he's like half French, half Italian. He's Corsican. And um, so we do this meeting and when we did it all in Italian. And I think that first off was very impressive mm. to him that I spoke Italian. And um, so anyway, it, it led to, okay, we'd, we'd like to try out in this program. So for the rest of the year then, um, we did a, well, it was two big sort of scouting tests in Formula Renault cars. So we did one at, um, we did one in Magione in Italy, just a small track. And we did another one at the, I think it was the A1 track um, in Austria. And uh, and there were a couple of drivers there that had experience in cars. Uh, uh, Vilando was one of the drivers that went. Um, Kubica was one Frank myself but there were a lot of drivers there were there were a few Swede drivers they kept on trying out because Uwe Anderson really wanted a Swede driver to be a part of the program um, but anyway I went through all the tests and uh, came out and, and I must have done really well and um, by the end of that year they pulled me out of the uh, Tony Kart contract um, put me into the Formula Renault Winter Series at the end of 2000 so I did the winter series and then signed me up to do full time Formula Renault the next year things progressed pretty quickly from there I mean that's the thing to let our listeners know if if they were to look purely at your at your CV it looks like this seismic jump mate because the next thing you get an opportunity you know an extension of what you've talked about with Toyota that that leads to testing opportunities and, and then later Friday the Friday driving role I mean that's huge yeah it, it, it was crazy, actually. I mean, because here I am, a, you know, just out of go-karts. And now, so my first year in cars, I'm doing Formula Renault. We uh, had a really good year. I won the Italian Championship. I uh, won a couple of races in the Euro Cup Championship, which we weren't doing the full season in. So just the few races we did, I won two of them, which was amazing. And then at the um, in, in September they offered to give me a test in their F1 car. It's like, really? So this is, you know, like... You did a double take when you looked at me then, so you must have done that at the time when the call yeah. came through or whatever. Yeah. Where was the test? I mean, this is in a great period of Formula One. Admittedly, Toyota at this stage are kind of the new kids on the yeah. block, but, but you know, fans that love the sport, love the engines in that yeah. era and, and so on. Where did you drive it? What did you think? Was it was it mind-blowing? It was mind-blowing because here I am just out of a Formula Renault car, barely out of go-karts. And um, we went to Paul Ricard, which was, you know, Toyota had their, you know, garages and everything. So that was the test track. And uh, just went and and it's got long straight as well so here I go in the F1 car and it was just mind blowing I mean the power the downforce and I mean it was just such an amazing experience Um, um, so I did the test and then they offered to sign me up as you know test driver the next year and and do Formula 3000 at the same time which is a massive step from what I'd been doing in Formula Renault so things probably progressed a bit too quickly looking back to be honest but you know they would ask me so do you feel up to it you know is this what you want to do I'm like uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> of course I do like no person's uh, going to turn no, that no I wasn't going to say no but you know the next year was you know it was a bit of a challenge I was testing F1 cars I was racing F3000 with drivers that have been racing cars for years and years and years um, and uh, you know it was, it was a bit of a difficult year you know I um you know, the team I was racing for won the championship the year before with Justin Wilson. Um, but the year I came in, everything changed. They were brand new cars. So everything was new. Teams was needed to do new setups and everything. And, um, you know, halfway through the year, um, you know, I'd had some decent, like, mid-pack results, but I wasn't competing for wins or anything. And I think you made a pretty decent or significant change in the racing side of it then, didn't you? So. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of it was me, you know, just lack of experience in a car that was that big and heavy to drive. And I was little still. Like, I was still pretty little. And a former 3000 car was a car that you really needed to muscle around. I mean, no power steering, big, heavy car, very comparable to an Indy car. Um, and, and it was just a bit of a struggle. And Toyota... 
mid-year they decided th- this this isn't really working, mm-hmm. whether it's me or the team. Yeah. Um, and they put me into German Formula 3 to finish out the year. And it was fantastic. I mean, I finished the year in German F3. I, I got a couple of podiums. And that was, you know, the most competitive Formula 3 championship in the world. And uh, so I went in and, and it went really well. So at that point for the next year, so now we're going into 2003, they said, all right, let's just let Ryan focus on racing. We'll do less of the Formula 1. So it, it was sort of a bit of a... I wouldn't say demotion, but it was like, let's focus on still honing his skills in in the racing world. And um, so I did F3 that year, the new Euro series, and um, it went awesome. We won eight races and won the championship and finished the year testing the F1 car. And then uh, that turned into then being full-time you know f1 test driver traveling to the grand prix and you know then doing friday practice sessions at grand prix and so forth so um yeah things were things were going well sometimes yeah. there are there are cards that fall a certain way that help in that regard too and, and i think the story went that um did they not promote ricardo Sonta to replace cristiano de Marta? and that, right. that opened the door didn't it so yes it did so we had two test drivers it was me and zonta mm-hmm. And uh, then Demata left the team mid-season and Zonta moved up into the race driver role, which then promoted me to the Friday session. So all of a sudden now I am Friday sessions reserve driver. And I did the last six Grand Prix of uh, 2004 in that, in that role. Yeah. There was chat, mate. There was a rumour about a, a potential move to, to Jordan. Yes. Um, was that rumour, I mean, did it have legs and how serious did it get? It, it, yeah, it had legs. Um, it was, we were trying to make it happen. And um, I was, I mean, f- firstly, I was hoping that I'd get the seat at Toyota. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, also being part of the Young Driver program had, and they'd brought me up through the ranks and it's, I th- I was hoping that's where it was leading to, which had been the initial idea of the whole deal. But Toyota hadn't been performing. Um, They'd been spending a lot of money and not getting the results. Mm. And basically from above then they were... um, It came down from Japan, we need two drivers in our race car that have one Grand Prix. And that wasn't me. <laughs> I'd never raced in Formula <laughs> One. <laughs> so uh, at that point, they signed um, who was it? Truly and uh, Schumacher, Ralph Schumacher, to pretty long-term contracts. So at that point, we're like, okay, what are my options? Because I was at the point where, okay, this is my time to either try to get a race seat, or it, at that time, I was thinking it's easy to fall into that role as a test driver and be because some drivers would just be test drivers then sort of for the rest of their careers and it's not what I was looking at and um, so Toyota were talking to Jordan about providing engines so there was going to be that link Um, but they were still they were still short like one and a half million and Toyota wasn't prepared to really spend that for me to race for a team that wasn't theirs but they said you could do it if you find the money so I actually came out here and did a little bit of, you know, fundraising, which is, I'd I'd never done it before, and I I don't think I was very good at it. (laughs) I didn't really know where to go, but I remember going to uh, Lindsay Fox's office in Melbourne. Had that conversation. I met with Lindsay Fox, and I don't think it went well at all. (laughs) I think he asked a lot of grilling questions, and I probably didn't have the right answers, but. but it wasn't for him, and and so during this time, I'm like, fuck, how are we gonna how are we gonna make this happen? And um, during this time, Max Angelelli, who was looking after me now and racing in the states, um, got contact through Chip Ganassi, and um, they were interested in giving me a test uh, in an Indy car. So I was like, all right, let's let's do it. So I flew out to out to um, America. Did a test at Phoenix. We did one day on the road course and then one day on the oval. Did the test. It went awesome. I had a blast. Loved everyone on the team. It was such a different atmosphere to Formula One. It was just so enjoyable. And then at the end of it, pretty soon after, like maybe a week or two or something, they're like, we'd love to have you 
race for us next year uh we're gonna pay you x and you know we want you to be our man next to scott dixon and darren manning racing for target in the car you know i didn't know much about indycar at the time but one of my all-time idols is uh alex Zanardi and him winning at surfers paradise doing donuts in the in target car and I was just like, geez, I've got Chip Ganassi racing, asking me to race their Indy car in target colours. And and I just never even... I just completely dropped any Formula 1 aspirations at that point and just said, that's it, that's what I'm doing. And I uh, just went blind into oval racing. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a big change, but it, a little surreal at the same time. I mean, Ganassi, legendary, you talked about the you know the famous colours. To be a part of that operation is, is huge. I want to understand how... Can you share with our listeners how different the car was to drive, and particularly on ovals for the first time? I mean, that's a, that's something yeah. very different, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, I was just so ignorant going in. Like, I'd, I'd, I hate to say it, I'd never really watched IndyCar, like, outside of Surface Paradise and a few laps at the Indy 500, but I was, never, I'd, I was so engrossed in Formula One. That's all I really used to watch. And uh, so I went in thinking... You know, pretty confident young guy, and um, I didn't really know what a car should feel like on an oval, and um, <clears throat> so I went in, and you know, we had a lot of we had a lot of accidents, and it, and it wasn't an easy year for the team either. We were we were running Toyota engines underpowered, massively underpowered, and trying to make up the difference by running less downforce, um, and so. I think for a rookie coming in and doing IndyCar, it was one of the more difficult situations. There wasn't much testing. Um, but, you know, I had I had some really good races, and I think it was the second race of the year. You know, albeit it was a, it was a street course, back sort of more in my wheelhouse, but I almost won, like, my second IndyCar race at St. Petersburg and then got tangled up with Canaan and <laughs> took me out of the race. And, and uh, But, you know, things... You know, I had a... I had a just such a good time racing the cars and great new challenge and doing the Indy 500 for the first time. I mean, I just, I had no idea how big it was. And just uh, that first time walking through Gasoline Alley out to the starting grid, um, I'll just never forget it. Like, it's always special, but that first time I ever did it, I just, it's just electrifying and to see that many people in one place. And so those sorts of experiences, they were just... uh, Unreal, you know. I got a pole position at Sonoma that year, um, and then and then I had the massive crash at Chicago, and that sort of put everything to a stop for a while. Um, but you know, I, I knew that you know, basically, America was you know where my future was was going to be in racing. More with Ryan Briscoe in a moment. In this series, I speak to some of the most passionate riders, drivers, designers and collectors I know, like Merrick Watts, the radio funny man and stand-up comedian who loves a good road trip and has been known to buy a resto project or two after a long lunch. I'd been drinking. <laughs> I, got, I got a gum tree. And because I'd seen this bike, it fell enough in Adelaide, I'd seen this old bike and I went, that looks great. And it's an ex-police bike, isn't it? It's an ex-police bike. Yeah. And it was in uh, concourse condition and I bought it and then I literally woke up the next day and I went, God, I had the weirdest dream last night. <laughs> and I bought a police bike. Oh, my God, I bought a police bike. <laughs> and it wasn't even like in Adelaide. It was like miles away. And oh, yeah, I've, I've still got that. Yeah, that's, that's at my house. <laughs> well, ask me when the last time I rode that was. Yeah, when did you Not last this ride year. that? Not this year. <laughs> Not this year. Listen to the full episode with Merrick Watts here on Rusty's Garage. The Bathurst 1000 race held at Mount Panorama. Once a year, fans come from all across Australia for this fast-paced tin-crushing, loud and highly competitive weekend of drinking. They might even watch some of the race as well, as long as it doesn't get in the way of the drinking. 
You talked about that massive crash in, in 2005 at Chicago Land Speedway. The, the vision is still kind of etched in my mind. I think the car climbed over Alex Barron's car, is that mm-hmm. right? What triggered it? Do you mind reliving it? I mean, it looks frightening to watch even now. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember. I think, you know, um, there were sort of unwritten rules in over, oval racing where if you, you know, enter on one groove you hold that groove and this and that and I think I was a little bit too stuck on what the etiquette rules were you know and um, um, I remember we went into turn three at Chicago and I went in on the middle groove one groove up from the bottom of the track overtaking uh, Alex Barron and he sort of came down and I think my lack of experience and you know we we just tangled wheels i think if that same scenario would have happened a few years later i I would have gone down with him and the crash wouldn't have happened so in the end i think it was probably my lack of experience and and whatever but um we tangled wheels and next thing i've I've ridden a wheel of his side by side open wheel cars and next thing it's just vertical and you're doing you know 200 and 15 mile an hour whatever that is big big in case (laughs) 360 or 70 i'm not sure um yeah and so next thing it's just vertical it was a a beautiful day i remember the blue sky um (laughs) but uh, i knew you know i'm i'm not really religious but i remember you know praying to god for a second like can we come out of this and uh um yeah just you know I was okay in the end, you know, broke a few but, but bones. Injuries, though, yeah, yeah um, I mean, it was it was a massive impact. I think they saw on the uh, on the car the G force spiked at a hundred and between one hundred and seventy and one hundred and ninety Gs. I mean, it went straight into the pole. The engine stuck on the pole and just dropped to the ground, like right where we went in. And I pirouetted and. Uh, but there was there was fire too. We were using methanol back then, so there was fire in the cockpit when the car came to a stop. And um, I remember the I must have blacked out. But when I came to, I remember there was fire and it was hot and everything. And the officials came to get me out of the car. And I just remember being in there. The first thing I did was wiggle my toes. I was like, okay, I can feel my feet, so that's good. And then they're there trying to get me out. And, I'm, and I remember telling him, like, go away, go away, like, because I didn't want him to get burnt. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm in there burning. Yeah. But no, but they dragged me out of the car and, and put me on the stretcher and put the fire out. And I just, I, I didn't have, like, bad burns, but I just inhaled some. And so I had burns in, on the insides of my lungs a little bit. So I had to use oxygen for about eight days, I think, after the crash, just because of the scabbing inside. Um, but I had you know, micro fractures to seven vertebrae. I broke both collarbones and um, maybe a toe in my foot. I can't remember. But, I mean, relatively small injuries, you know, um, in hindsight. So, yeah, I mean, I was I was extremely lucky for, for the, how big of a crash it was. It's a brutal game, mate. Um, you would part ways with, with Chip. Uh, how difficult was, was that to negotiate because you talked a moment ago about what uh, everything had kind of come together legendary outfit you're a part of this yeah. this operation that must have been tough to take um yeah i mean i was there wasn't any sort of negotiation i was pretty much on a hospital bed um i think you know there were probably a lot of doubts whether i would want to come back and race indycar um and I wasn't sure I wanted to at the time either. Um, Yeah, I mean, I I had doubts as well. I just wasn't sure how I was going to recover and if I was going to enjoy it anymore. So how did you get on top of that? What 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 did you do to you know make Ryan Briscoe say yes? I you know I've got to get back on the horse. Well, it was it was interesting. I mean, (laughs) it was kind of a funny sequence of events. So I was I went to Italy to you know do rehab and and heal and then it was uh so the the crash actually happened on the 11th of september Mm -hmm. and then so it took about three months to heal up um 
it was December and I'm in Homestead doing some pre-Daytona testing. I was going to do the 24 hours with, with Max, Angela Lee, Wayne Taylor. And uh, I'm on the timing stand. I hadn't even driven the car yet. So I hadn't driven any car since the crash. And so I'm a bit nervous. I'm excited. I'm nervous, you know, to get in a Daytona prototype. And I'm on the timing stand and I get a phone call. And I look down and it's plus four nine, blah, 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 blah. So I'm like, the only plus four nines I have are Toyota. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'll take this call. So I answer it and it's uh, Richard Cregan, uh, the, yeah. you know, general manager at uh, Toyota Formula One. And he's like, hey, Ryan, uh, how's it going? I'm like, oh, I'm good. I'm just at the racetrack. He's like, oh, good, good, good. Um, hey, uh, would, would you be interested in coming over and uh, doing a test for us um, in Spain? I'm like, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Um, he's like, uh, well, we, we're going to need you here tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, uh, okay, uh, I don't know if we can do that. But anyway, long story, four hours later, I'm on a flight out of Miami, uh, heading straight for Spain and <laughs> thinking... Am I doing the right thing? Like, how, is my neck going to hold my head on top of my shoulders for this? Because I haven't driven a car since I just had a massive crash. But I had been working out, you know, as you do when you injure yourself, you almost work out more than what you did before. But I went and did a three-day test at um, Hareth, which is one of the hardest tracks for neck and G-forces and stuff. <laughs> um it was just funny though, because they just—he said, oh, "We just we can't, you know. Truly's in Italy doing something. Ralph, we're not sure where he is. Zonta's un- unreachable in Brazil. <laughs> like they didn't have any drivers, so uh, they just rang me up, and I just said, yes, 'Yes, I'll do it.' And um, the irony is, it was good for you, wasn't it? It was good for you to realise, okay, you know. it was great. It was great because I got in the car, did three days in the car, and ran really well we did tyre testing and aero testing and the, it was just fantastic it was so much fun to be back in a Formula 1 car um, and actually we organised a champ car test for the following week so from Spain I flew straight back to Florida and then did a um, champ car test in Sebring and um, so then things were rolling and I was confident and, and felt strong and I was like you know mentally um, I was like, yes, this is, I can do it. Nothing's changed. And, uh, you know, let's, let's get on, let's get on with business. And so, you know, I, um, started, you know, trying to find a, a Indy car or champ car ride for, uh, 2006. Um, the thing was with the, the champ car ride, I did the test with, uh, PKV, mm-hmm. which was a Cal Coven team, and they sort of dragged that on and, you know, I did a couple of tests with them. It went really well and they implied that it was all going to happen and then it was like at the last hour they signed uh, Catherine Legg in, you know, mm. instead of me and I, I think there were other reasons, you know, political reasons or whatever. And, and so, th- but that was a bit unfortunate because it sort of left me high and dry a little bit that late in the off season. So then I started talking to some IndyCar teams and I remember talking to Ray Hall and and I really got the impression that people were a bit nervous about how I was going to handle ovals again. Okay. Champ Car didn't do ovals. Mm. And so that was never even a problem. But IndyCar was still like 90% oval racing. They had three road courses. And... Um, you know, and I'd sort of made a vow to myself after the crash. I was like, I'm, I have no problem going over racing, but I'm only going to do it with a top team that I know that it's, you know, the equipment is safe. And, you know, there was sort of a new respect for the danger of oval racing and, high, and super speedway racing. So I was like, okay, I'll only do it with a top team. And then uh, Dryan, I started talking to Dryan Reinbold, which is a small team. And went to them and they were really interested in me they wanted me to do like the full season and we went back and said no I just want to do the road courses so I think there was I definitely had a barrier still and it wasn't just from me it was from Max as well and and my parents so and 
and um, so I said I'll just do the road courses and then you know as the year was going on and um, we were starting to realise that it was going to be difficult for me to go back IndyCar racing unless I made the impression to everyone that I can go oval racing and that I, and I think I still had to prove it to myself too so then with Dry and Reinbold I said um, they had two races available for me to do it was Nashville and Milwaukee so I ended up doing uh, four races with them I did Nashville Milwaukee uh, Sonoma and Watkins Glen and uh, and it was the best thing I, I did really to just get back into the IndyCar scene because I went out and ran competitively um, we actually picked up the podium at Watkins Glen um, I had a really good race at uh Nashville, like we ran, I think top ten, which for that car was was really really good, and and for me as well, it was the first time back on an oval since I'd had the crash, so I sort of proved to myself that you know I could do it, you know, and and um, and I felt good doing it, so so things you know were were getting back on track, and uh, and then it was at the end of that year then that Penske came and asked if I'd be interested in uh, joining their sports car program in the RS Spider. Um, I went to... Uh, I think I, I did a test in France. We went. I went first to Germany. We did the test at uh, Weissach yeah. on their test track, which an RS Spider should never go on. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, you know, so that was happening. and then. But I hadn't met Roger yet, and... Um, I was actually already living in North Carolina, so uh, Tim Sindrick, I remember it was crazy. He was like, we're going to... He asked if uh, I was available this night of the week to go and meet Roger and, and we'll go and have dinner. So um, it was like, a, I don't know what day of the week, a Monday or a Tuesday. So uh, we jump on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> on Roger's plane, fly to Detroit, <laughs> have dinner. And... Um, during dinner uh, it was funny because Roger just sprung it on everyone I guess I, he hadn't talked to anyone about it but we met he liked me you know we got talking and then he, uh, he just sprung it at the table he's like we should run Briscoe at Indy next year let's do that and like I remember looking at Cindric and he's just like <laughs> really like how, how the hell are we going to do that and they had the you know Marlboro sponsorship still and I think there was like a two car contract with that and you know they couldn't run three and so wheels are turning then and um so we flew back home that night and now i'm like oh yes and um you know what was really cool about that whole deal then that i learned afterwards that you know i think they had long-term plans for hornish mm -hmm. they knew that he wasn't going to be staying on the indycar team that hornish had nascar aspirations and um so they were starting to look to who was going to replace him and I was I was that guy so they actually ended up signing me to a to the Porsche contract to race the Spider but they also put me on a separate contract as reserve driver for the IndyCar team um, and and then and then we sort of set up the Lusso Dragon racing as a as the car that I would race uh, the Indy 500 in that year um, which was a third Penske car, but we weren't allowed to say it at the time. <laughs> I think I can say it now. It's 11 years ago. <laughs> um, but it was great and, uh, you know, came fifth, um, had an awesome race. And um, so, you know, and then obviously had a great year racing the RS Spider that year. And then I think everything sort of went to plan and Hornish stepped out of the Indy car went to NASCAR and that was then I stepped into the you know Marlboro Team Penske IndyCar team let's talk about some of these cool cars mate because I mean firstly to hook up with an automotive icon a racing legend in Roger Penske from you know your career point of view after leaving Ganassi and then you know the ups and downs of where am I going I mean that's a that's a huge tick yeah. for you um, firstly tell me about Share with our listeners what it's like to drive an Indy car pinned at speed around the famed brickyard when it's full of people at Indianapolis. I mean, that just that's not that's not something that's easily described, but it must be incredibly special. It is. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's just such a magical place. I mean, it, and it's just the the traditions and and how Americans embrace tradition. Mm-hmm. I think is really special. I mean, the the pre race ceremonies for the Indy Five Hundred last like an hour yeah. and um it's, it's hairs on the back of your neck stuff it isn't is it? the whole time and and you're i don't think i've ever started an indy 500 where i haven't actually gotten emotional and started crying wow. like on the grid before the race starts just because there's so much and you've got everyone coming up and just wishing you the best and like it's it's hard for me to not like feel emotional just talking about it it's just uh something that's very unique um that i've never experienced anywhere else um I mean, nothing against, you know, Le Mans, but the, the, the emotions that I've experienced at uh, Indy just don't compare to anything else. So it's such a such a special place. And, uh, you know, back to your question, what it's like driving. It's, it's, I think, back with the old Indy car, back so, like, 09 and stuff. Yeah, I just remember qualifying laps around there, and uh, it was... So hair raising. I put, mean, put us in the cockpit. What are we talking power plant wise? What are we talking speeds wise? Tell us. Um, power, what were we running? Like six fifty horse or something. But you know, you, you're running really long gears at Indy, so the horsepower doesn't feel astronomical, and it sort of takes the full, you know, lap two and a half miles to two laps to wind the thing up. And next thing you're doing, you know. 230 plus top speeds and oh, wow. and on a pretty narrow track and um, you know you go out for qualifying and you've got the car trimmed out to levels that the car's just floating through the corners I mean really low like we were running 1500 pounds of downforce basically at 200 mile an hour which is very light that's not a lot of downforce you know it's just very slippery top speeds um you've got like three top gears so you you sort of go through like third then you've got a massive drop to fourth gear it's like eh, boy you pull fourth gear and then you've got you know fourth fifth and sixth gears that are all like just 100 rpm from each other so you're sort of talking about that fine tuning depending on where the wind is you're doing a little bit of shifting to have that peak rpm down one straight or the other um but yeah i mean getting a little bit of a slide i mean it's like you finish four laps of qualifying at indy i remember and and i would just be destroyed and then you'd have to go back and do it again and withdraw your time that you just did to go and do it again it's i think it's still extremely stressful qualifying at indy i i think they've made it so that you can do more qualifying attempts and not withdraw withdraw your time which is better for the fans because more drivers do more qualifying attempts but but back when you every time had to withdraw your time to go again i mean it was stress to the max (laughs) absolutely and um yeah i remember like qualifying third and i qualified second and third on the old car and it was just hard 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 work and i remember the year i qualified pole which was the first year on the new car was actually a lot easier than when i (laughs) had qualified on the front row the the previous years but uh, but I only qualified on pole by like a about ten one ten thousandth of a second or so. It was so close with Hinchcliffe. That part of it was stressful, just watching him go for it and yeah. be so close. But um, but yeah, I mean, any time going at those speeds around Indy is uh, is special. You got your first win from memory at uh, at Milwaukee. How much of a relief was that? And I want to, for the sake of people listening, I mean, you got to join a very cool Penske club by doing that to win your first race with that organisation. Paul Tracy, Elio Castroneves, Rick Mears, the legendary Mark Donoghue, and here's Ryan Briscoe ticking that box too. Very cool. It was it was it was a massive box to tick. It was really good timing. Um, Milwaukee always followed immediately after the Indy 500 mm. and so I'd gone to Indy you know it was my first race in a you know Marlboro Colors at Indy um, we were having an okay race but it was sort of highlighted by me having contact with Danica Patrick uh, in pit lane I mean, it was it was a racing incident on pit lane but I copped a lot of flag for it right and she was so popular um, and she really 
made a huge scene about it, you know. And um, so then all of a sudden, you know, it's like everyone's rumouring, you know, Briscoe's out at Penske, this and that, and it's just, you know... Uh, typical motor crazy racing. Crazy town, <laughs> typical motor racing. And, um, you know, I'm, what, four races into being a Penske driver and he hasn't won a race yet, you know, and it's like there's a lot of pressure to to be a winner when you're racing for Penske. And um, so to follow that up then at Milwaukee, which is one of the toughest tracks that you'll ever go to. Yeah, it was extremely good. It was extremely good timing to, to get that win. And it was just a really fun race, good race with Dixon the whole way through and uh, just a massive win. It was number 300 for Roger. Um, and uh, amazing to think that almost exactly 10 years after that, he's got 500 now. So, I mean, it's a massive <laughs> record of wins he's got per year. But, uh, yeah, that was number 300 for him. And, um, you know, then the year just kept getting better and better. I think that took a lot of weight off my shoulders and sort of just really started coming into my own in the team. And, um, you know, we followed up with another win at uh, Mid-Ohio and uh, finished, I think, fourth or fifth in the championship which was good um and and then we got the the win at surface paradise too in the non-points race so that, that was, was my really next cool. question to you i mean to win in australia with that organization mm. i mean that's a famous famous race and that must have felt cool oh it was um that was amazing actually it was uh well and as i said like earlier in the in the show just one of my idols of, of racing was Alex Zanardi and one of my best memories is him winning at surfers and doing donuts in the last corner and uh, so for me to you know go and win at surfers on the exact same track um, you know in a car I guess it was now basically 10 years I think he won in it was 98 or 99 I think but so it's 10 years later and I'm at that level and uh, and winning at surfers in IndyCar I had to go and do donuts in the last corner, so I did. <laughs> How exhilarating was the ride around there? I mean, it's it's an unforgiving joint. It's a bit like a pinball machine if you get it wrong, but if you get it right, it must must be cool. It is, yeah. I mean, it's um, I'd say for sure the toughest street course. Um, but well, sorry, there's Macau. It was pretty tough, but <laughs> didn't race indie cars around there. But uh, no, it's it's a tough place. It was very fast. Um, I remember qualifying for that race was in a drying track condition so it started wet and then it was drying and so every lap's faster and uh had a great battle with uh power and dixon i think power got the pole and i was second and dixon was third um it was just a great battle really challenging and uh yeah and um sort of win there was pretty phenomenal fellow Aussie Will Power you're talking about and Scott Dixon the Kiwi of course who's done some phenomenal things in, in his career in, uh, yeah. in IndyCar and continues to do so let's talk about the RS Spider because mm. um, you brought that up before in, in the range of cars that, that Porsche have it holds a, a bit of a special space in LMP2 terms or sports yeah. car terms and you got to be a part of that great program didn't you? Yeah, I, yeah it was really special and um, I think you know <clears throat> certainly one of the you know cars that will go down in history has been one of Porsche's iconic race cars that they've built um, hard to drive at the limit what was it like what, easy? Oh, it was great to drive mm-hmm. it was so good to drive it had so much downforce and um, it really was I mean you know any car you drive to the limit you've, you're on the limit and you're finding its limits but it really was a really good car to drive on the limit um, massive speeds uh it was actually speed wise it was very similar to an indy car i mean and this was a much heavier car than an indy car but i remember i think it was the following year it was in 08 um i can't remember the reasons i replaced just as a one-off at detroit one of the i think it was sasha Marson. so i came in and just filled in for his seat and so i did the double header i did the indy car race and the imsa race on the same weekend so I was driving the IndyCar and the, the RS Spider, and the RS Spider was a lot easier to drive than the IndyCar because it had power steering and stuff. But I did an overlay from qualifying, and um, the lap time difference was exactly one second. The IndyCar was faster by one second, and the only difference was the straight. 
like the IndyCar just accelerated and had a bit higher top speed, and that's the o- that's the only place where the lap time was faster for the IndyCar, and everywhere else. The spider was breaking as late, if not later, than the Indy car. The corner speeds, minimum speeds. Uh, in the slow corners, the spider was quicker in the minimum speeds. So, you know, it really was an impressive car. And we used to, you know, we'd go to Sebring and just, uh, it was it was a lot of fun. With a good team of, of guys as well. Great team of, of races that you were, yeah. you were paired with or partnered with. Yeah, great, great team. Um, I was partnered with Sasha Marsen. Uh, we were using uh, Emmanuel Collard as our third driver for the long races. And then you had uh, Timo Bernard, Romain Dumas um, in the other car. Um, and those guys were just so much fun. They're like, they're, and they're still the same. They're just like inseparable twins, you know, and there's every, they just went everywhere together. But they did a fantastic job and uh, they won the championship. We came second and um, just had a great time racing with them. You are back at Bathurst, which is fantastic, and you are here with a very special car too, the Ford GT. It's captured the attention of, of lots of people. I thought Mark Winterbottom had a great a great comment today, and he, he said that if we took a supercar, a V8 supercar to Le Mans, everyone would be like, man, show me yeah. this car, what's it like? And it's, it's that way for you with this machine, mm. isn't it? Tell us about it, and what is it like to drive around the mountain? So, you know, I think the what's really special still about the Ford GT is just, you know, not many people have seen them. Mm. And this is actually the first Ford GT to, you know, be in Australia. Yeah. Um, it's still a very new product. You know, there aren't that many that have been sold, you know, as road cars. So I think it's still a car that... Um, when when you drive it down pit lane still wherever i go you drive it down pit lane and it just turns heads everyone just wants to look at it and it's such a it's so low it you know it sort of looks like a batmobile and it's got the buttresses uh over the back of it and it's just um such an amazing car and still in keeping with the original like 60s gt40 it, it looks so much like the original car it's just modernized with aerodynamics and and so forth but um it's just such a a a cool thing to be able to come out here um show it off to everyone here at the mountain to drive it around bathurst you're talking about an an amazing car on the best track in the world um in in front of my family and and uh you know you know at home so uh it's it's just great to to be out here and, and taking it for a spin. What are we talking in terms of, of horsepower and some of the data on that? It? It's 3.5 litre twin turbo, is that right? Yep, um, yep, V6 twin turbo. Um, I mean, so the road car puts out 647 horse. Which is impressive as it is. Yeah, um, it's just, there's, you know, and it sounds awesome. You know, for a turbo, you can hear the turbos. It's loud. Um, you know, the race car is, uh, you know, tuned down. Uh, you know, it's, you got the balance of performance and we, we have to pull the boost out of it to race against um, our other competitors and just for a speed target that, you know, Imps and WEC want us to race at. Um, I wish we could just run it full tilt all the time because I think that's what this car's built for it's built to take you know 650 horse and uh, and do those sort of speeds but um, yeah it's it's just a, it's such a good car to drive it's it's as I said it's the centre of gravity is so low you're sitting so low to the ground um, the Mustang's such a cool car I was sitting in the garage earlier and uh, I had the Mustang like right in front of me and I asked the guy, I was like, is that thing on the ground? Like, I was looking underneath the Mustang. That's how low you're sitting in the Ford GT. I mean, and the Mustang's a, you know, I mean, it's a race car. It's, it's uh, but man, compared to the Ford GT, this thing is so low. And um, yeah, and so now what, we're in our third year racing it in the States and uh, we've had a lot of success. Um, you know, a couple of, you know, the team won Le Mans, uh, we've won Daytona twice and, I was in the Daytona winning car this year, which was amazing. So the car's had a lot of success in the short time it's it's been around. And um, I think it's just, I was so excited when Ford talked about bringing it out here to Bathurst to show it off. 
um, in front of my you know home crowd. You know, I was uh, stoked to be a part of that. So much so that you were in the simulator prepping for it. I saw, I saw some pics of that, which is great. It brings well, you. It, yeah. it, it, I mean, any, I was like, you know, the simulator. It's it's very cool and it costs a lot of money, but. You know, it's still a bit of a video game and I was like who doesn't want to drive a 4 GT on a you know 10 million dollar or whatever it costs video game at Bathurst so when they said uh, we were testing at Atlanta last week and I'm at the test and they were like hey we just got Bathurst on the simulator because they didn't have the track before I'd I'm there I'm there like, yeah <laughs> they're like if you want it you can come up and drive I was like oh yeah let's do it so I went up and um yeah, did some hot laps and tuned it all up. I got the setup perfect and I had my, you know, soft tires on the thing and I put the long gear ratios in it and uh, and um, I was doing like 58s or something on the sim. So it's got potential. It's, I mean, that car is, is perfectly suited for a track like Bathurst. I mean, that's it's built for top end and, and fast corners and that's that's what Bathurst is all about. That leads me to a, an obvious question, and that is, is there some unfinished Bathurst business for you? You've obviously been here with Jimmy Richards and the Holden Racing Team um, in supercars, so it's not completely um, new to you, so to speak, mm-hmm. but would you like to come back and have, a, have another crack at the 1000? I'd love to. Yeah, I mean, I, I love this race, the event. Um, I love driving the supercars. You know, they're great cars, unique and difficult, um, but I've always enjoyed it, and... Um, so yeah, I mean, the last time I did it was 2013, and um, it's it's just been a bit difficult because you've sort of got to commit to the Pertec Enduro Cup, yeah. which is you know the three races, which is which is really cool. Uh, it's just that when you're racing for a championship overseas, and you've got to be flying back and forth, and and I remember the last time I did it in 13. It was just really, it was really hard. It was taxing, and I couldn't come out and do any testing throughout the year. Um, and it was hard to sort of give 100% of myself uh, to the team over here uh, because of the the busy commitment um, in America. Um, but yeah, I mean, absolutely. And being here this weekend, you know, it's I just like I want to get out there and, and have another go. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, I haven't been talking to anyone about it, but uh, I'd love to. Cool. Let's power through some stuff to finish here. The podcast is called Rusty's Garage. So firstly, what is Ryan Briscoe's daily driver? Um, I have a Ford Raptor, F-150 nice. Raptor in the States, which is my uh, company car, which is, <laughs> thank you Ford for that, because it's, uh, it's an awesome company car. And I live where it snows a lot in the winter too, so it's just a beast in the snow. It'll go through anything. Are there any, like your, uh, like your dad had mm. when you were growing up, are there any resto projects in the garage? And if there aren't, what's on the wish list? Um, well, there, there could be a Ford GT uh, in 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 the near future. <laughs> so, <laughs> like hint hint wink wink. <laughs> so yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, yeah. So, uh, but no, I'm, I'm not much of a mechanic, so I'm not I, I'm not really into the restoring. I I love new cars a lot. <laughs> so what is 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 there a Grail car? If your wife said to you, okay, unlimited budget, knock yourself out. Is there one that you you would have to have? And it doesn't have to be a modern car necessarily. Is there a supercar of some kind that um, you'd like to own? Oh man. Um, it's it's hard to beat. I mean, this sounds like branding, <laughs> you know. But uh, you know, Ford the new Ford GT is is pretty amazing, and I've been able to test it and um, you know drive it and drive passengers and stuff, and it's about as good as it gets as a road car. Um, I don't know. As far as anything else, I'm not I'm not really sure. Like there are so many cars, and I've I've been able to drive a lot of great cars, you know, for people and just various events. Um, I do love Porsches. Um, I actually got to drive a couple of weeks ago a 918 um, Spider, which was pretty mind blowing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's you know, I don't know. I just cars are so expensive <laughs> <laughs> typical race driver you probably got the first dollar you own right um, 
What do you listen to when you drive? Are you uh, are you sort of dictated to by by the family and what the family wants to listen to? What's on the yeah. radio or podcast? Hey, Dad, can you put the silly songs on? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, really? <laughs> Again? Uh, yeah. So yeah, a lot of silly songs. Um, but I, I honestly, I, I don't. I'm not stuck in one genre. Um, I love uh, like '90s rock music. Um, but I also like uh, like EDM music too. I listen to a lot of that. It's just sort of you can space out to, <laughs> to what, dro- music, yeah. what drives you mad on the road. What habits of fellow motorists get under you? Um, oh, so many, so <laughs> many. <laughs> I really shouldn't be allowed to drive on the road because I'm just you just get so annoyed with people on the road. Um, and it's hard in America because there's just no etiquette. You know, like you know staying in the slow lane if you're not doing the speed limit or you know uh so here's one someone overtaking a truck who's doing five under the speed limit and they sit in the fast lane and don't like finish the pass and they're just sitting there and you're like let's go you know yeah um i don't know that general stuff the stuff that everyone gets annoyed at i guess you've had an incredible career mate and and you know there's still more to to come but you've had success in all sorts of different categories and uh, at all sorts of great race tracks is there one track you talked about how indy is such a special place mm-hmm. for you but is there one race one result one track that is you know you got you have a soft spot for and on that note a race car from your career that you've got you know maybe mm-hmm. a bit of a, a mental attachment to um, I've never had a good run at Bathurst yeah. um, and I've, I've done the race three times and uh, you know it was it really was a, a special opportunity for me when I was able to come out and race with Jim Richards you know the legend Jim Richards and I'm co-driver with him unfortunately I never got in the car that day <laughs> and we had a rocket ship um, it was you know I think we were going to have a good day but um you know, Bathurst, you know, I think every time I've gotten in the car for this race, I've been a lap down or, or you know, close to or something. So I just haven't really had a good run. It would be nice to come back here and, and run competitive and, you know, have a result. Um, th- you know, the Bathurst podium is is one of those special podiums that you see the pictures of and stuff. And I sort of compare it to, like, Monza, Formula One, that podium, Le Mans. yes. That was really special. Like, you go up on the podium and then it's just like a sea of people below you. And uh, I think Bathurst has that same kind of feeling. So it's not just the whole... It's the event, it's everything, but it's the celebration after. If you can actually get a result of it, you know, win or, you know, be on the podium. Um, I think Bathurst is is pretty much as good as it gets for, for that sort of uh, winning feeling. Well done, mate. Congratulations on everything you've achieved. We wish you continued success. And it's been great just to walk down memory lane about some of the the great cars and and the things over time. (laughs) Cheers. Yeah, thank you very much. Rusty's Garage is written and presented by me, Greg Rust. Series producer and editor is Alex Mitchell. Audio production by Darcy Thompson. Listener.